Well, Donna, thank you very much for, for joining me today. And one of the challenges that I had preparing for this interview was knowing where to start because there are so many different topics that we could cover and so many things that you, you know so much about. So what I'd like to start, before we talk about your book, uh, The Delinquent Teenager, which I'd love to get into in a minute, I want to know why did you write a book? Why did you think it was necessary for yourself to get into this issue of climate change and to, to write about the subjects that you did? Well, I left journalism after a number of years. I decided to do something else with my life, and I went off in a totally different direction. And then I started getting very annoyed and very alarmed, because every time I opened a newspaper or turned on the television, this was about 19, 2009, mm. uh, it was climate change, climate change, the, uh, the seas are going to overwhelm us, and the, the planet is going to turn into a fireball. And, and the coverage seemed very shallow to me. It mm. seemed... Um, it seemed like the, the journalists were just repeating dogma and they were repeating conventional wisdom and that there was no scrutiny and there was no, um, yeah, there was no scrutiny at all. So I started doing a bit of my own research just sort of out of curiosity. This doesn't sound right. This might... So if I can interrupt, at that point, <clears throat> at that point, did you have an overarching view on, on climate change? Not at all. And I had not, as a journalist before, in my previous incarnation as a journalist, written about the environment at all. It just had not been an area of concern to me. You know, privately, I love to ride my bicycle and recycle and, and compost and garden, and, and I love nature and all those things. But it, and the environment had never been something that I had, had paid any attention to. But it was the dogma and the rhetoric, and it sounded very exaggerated, and it sounded very ill-informed. So I started doing just a tiny bit of research on my own, mm -hmm. and it didn't take me any time at all to find out that, in fact, there is a raging debate mm -hmm. about climate in the science community, that there isn't just one point of view, that, in fact, there are many very credentialed, experienced, um, sincere scientists who have some very big doubts about the, you know, we're all going to die, climate change is a catastrophe mm -hmm. narrative. And I got very annoyed that I had not heard about those scientists, that I had only heard one side of the story. Mm -hmm. And so I had one of the things I'd been dabbling in was some web design, and so I um, designed a website called noconsensus.org and the purpose of that website was just to say to the public there's another point of view out here and if we're going to make informed decisions as a society we should know what that other point of view is and I don't know who's right but there are scientists who disagree with the with the predominant view about climate change and I think we should listen to them and take their views into account um, so that's where it started. Where it all started. Now that may come as something of a surprise for a lot of people because we hear and we're reminded regularly that there is apparently a 97% consensus amongst the world's uh, climate scientists. But you're saying that you found it very easy to find people who in your view were very well credentialed and, and had every right to speak on the subject. So why is there such a disparity between what you found and what we're being told in terms of the consensus? We're told that the science is settled that there is a consensus. The only thing remaining left to do is to, to, to take action. There's no, no argument, there's no debate. So how come we're being told that if there is a debate? Well, I think there are a few reasons. One of them is that many journalists, unfortunately, are very sloppy. Um, um, some of them are rushed. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they have to produce more with less time. And so, and climate science, you know, it took me about a year of reading a lot of books mm -hmm. and doing a lot of research before I felt comfortable saying much at all about what was going on in climate science. So it's a pretty big learning curve. So you, if you are just an ordinary journalist, um, general assignment journalist, you've been given the job of going and covering this climate change event where mm -hmm. some famous scientist is saying that the world is about to end if we don't do something drastic, mm -hmm. um, you don't really know any better. You know, you really can't be expected to know any better. So, so between, you know, inexperienced journalists, rushed journalists, and sloppy journalists, a lot of stuff is reported as fact, which is not fact. And then there's the other big problem, and that's that if you do a survey of journalists, any survey I've ever heard of any in any country around the world, 
most journalists will self-identify as being left of center. And they are entitled to be left of center, but being left of center comes with some baggage. And one of the things that, that left of center people tend to be is very fervent environmentalists. And so rather than being um, you know, a hard-nosed reporter who's skeptical of everything and is not going to take anyone's word for anything, the environment, you know, the people on the environmental beat as journalists tend to go native. They tend to start seeing themselves as part of the cause or, you know, helping the cause, helping get that message out. Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, and I think shamefully, um, totally abandoning their duty to the public. It is not your role as a journalist to tell the public what the truth is. Your role is to tell them what's going on so that they can make their own informed decision. Where does this 97% figure come from, this, this idea that there is a 97% consensus? Well, the 97% comes up, has come up uh, on, on a few occasions, and my understanding is that it, it is the result of some very flawed surveys of the scientific literature, not of scientists, because to my knowledge, no one has ever polled scientists and asked them you know, some very, very specific, but also very intelligent questions. For example, everyone is going to tell you whether they are a skeptic or, or, or a, you know, an alarmist uh, with respect to climate change, that mm -hmm. climate change happens. Of course climate change happens. Mm -hmm. You know, here in Canada, 20,000 years ago, we were buried under a couple miles of ice, mm -hmm. you know? That ice has been receding for 20,000 years. And back then, there were no SUVs and there was, was no heavy industry. You know, the ice has been receding all on its own. It's part of natural climate change. Nothing ever stays static in nature. Things are always changing. So, so if you say, do you believe in climate change? Everyone is going to say yes. Every scientist is going to say yes. So that is not a useful question. Right. A useful question would be, do you think that human-generated CO2 emissions or human-generated greenhouse gases is a significant contributor to what we are seeing now? That would be a more intelligent question. Right. But that's not the kinds of survey questions that are being asked. So anyway, so. Uh, long story short, some very, very flawed surveys of literature in the scientific literature have been used to come up with this 97%. But, you know, when you look at the methodology of those surveys, there's tons of problems. They're not reputable. But the, the side of the, of the debate that is very concerned about climate change um, will seize on that 97% headline and they are actually not very rigorous about looking underneath to see whether, you know, is, is this reputable research or not. And so, for example, we're told that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is supposed to be this body of the world's top scientists and they all agree that climate change is, is, is a big problem and it's caused by humans and it's going to be catastrophic. Well. That's absolutely false because those scientists who work on those reports are not polled. No one asks them. No one asks them on an individual basis, do you agree with that statement? In fact, only a few dozen people who work on one particular chapter, which is the attribution chapter of an IPCC report, get to make a decision and express a viewpoint about whether this is predominantly um, linked to human activity. A right. very small number. So, you know, 97% of scientists have never been asked that question. So, you know, the, the, the perception that, that that's the case is, it's, you know, it's wrong. And it doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of effort to, um, to, to do some very rudimentary research online and find that out. Now you mentioned flawed research and flawed methodologies and I, I think that's a theme that really comes out in, in the book that you released. Can you tell me a little bit, uh, just remind me what the title of that book is and perhaps just take us through a survey of some of the key findings that you came across that really compelled you to need to write a book and let people know what you found. 
Well, I started off thinking I was writing a very different book. I, my, my original idea was 10 reasons to be calm, cool, and collected about global warming. And it was, it was going to be a list of, well, this, this is a bit fishy, and this doesn't quite sound right, and this very, very prominent scientist has raised these issues, so it was going to be, that, that was going to be the book. And then it turned out that I ended up writing a book about a United Nations body no one has ever heard of before. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you tell people, they say, oh, what's your book about? I say, it's about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Say, oh, what's that? <laughs> so it's very difficult to write an expose about an organization no one's heard about. You know, you have to sort of be, be in the climate space for a little while and, you know, paying attention to the debate before you even hear about this body. And the short form is IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel. And that's the key. This is not a panel of scientists. This is a panel of governments. It's a UN organization. The membership of the IPCC is nations. Okay, okay so, so this panel um, writes this report, this massive report around every six or seven years. It comes out with a new one. Mm -hmm. This f fall, in, in late two th 2013, mm -hmm. it's going to be um, assessment report number five mm. and sometimes that those reports are called the climate Bible because they are supposed to be the last best word on what's happening in climate research this panel is supposed to survey all that research and write a report and then governments of the world take a look at that report and say well we have to act on climate change because the IPCC this UN body says it's happening and it's serious and it's our fault so this report, you know, so I started hearing about this report and this organization, you know, I'm doing my research and I got this picture in my mind of this organization because, because the praise um, was, was um, you know, consistent across the board. Journalists thought this, this organization was fabulous, scientists thought it was fabulous. And so I formed this picture in my mind of what the IPCCC was, and, and it was of this very upstanding, meticulous professional in, in business attire. And, um, you know, people use words like preeminent and authoritative and gold standard. This is the IPCC. And then something strange happened because the more I actually learned about the IPCC and because my background was investigative journalism, when someone says we do X, I don't take their word for it. I actually go and check, do, you, do they do X? Mm -hmm. So once I started you know, doing some very basic fact checking, my image of the, you know, the, the upstanding professional in business attire vanished and what what took its place was actually kind of a, a delinquent teenager. Which is the, the title of your book, the, isn't it? The delinquent teenager who was mistaken for the world's top climate expert. Mm. Very long title, <laughs> um, but it's difficult. What do, you put, what do you say in your title? Mm. Expose of the IPCC. What's the IPCC? Actually, in the UK, the IPCC is the Police Com Complaints Commission. <laughs> so. So I got this image, the image that was replaced and that I have been left with is of a very lazy, very slapdash, um, very spoiled child who has been praised and flattered its entire existence. The IPCC is now 25 years old and has never been subjected to any media scrutiny. All the journalists have given this organization a pass. Oh, it's helping, you know, save the world. It's concerned about climate change. It must be, you know, just a paragon of virtue. Well, actually it's not. Actually, there are a great many serious problems with this organization. The big one being almost nothing it says about itself is actually true. So, Yes, yes. You know, do some very basic fact checking, and you find out that the mythology that we have been uh, we have been given about the IPCC, the journalists have been repeating for decades, turns out 
to be pretty much nonsense. Well, you, you're going to have to come up with some pretty good specifics <laughs> to back that up. Because as you say, they are the preeminent body. They are the number one. In, in a case of the IPCC's word against anyone else's word, the IPCC wins every single time. That's right. So for you to come out, I mean, people would be very quick to point out, A, you're not a climatologist. That's right. So who are you to criticise climatologists on issues of climate science? Uh, people would be very quick to point out that you're essentially a, a lone ranger, as it were, coming out and, and what, throwing rocks at a, at, a, at a hornet's nest. Like, what's, what's the game here? So um, specifics, please. What, what have you found specifically that might be able to convince me that the IPCC are not who I, like everyone else, have always been told they are. One of the things, I, I'm going to give you specifics in just a second, but I'm just going to preface it by saying that I am not a scientist. Mm -hmm. I have no scientific training whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I have no, I have not equipped to decide which scientist is, is right. Mm -hmm. So my criticism of the IPCC does not touch their science, okay? okay? What I am is a journalist, and I am perfectly capable of asking some very basic questions about an organization mm -hmm. and whether the organization lives up to its billing, whether mm -hmm. the things we have been told about the organization and how it behaves are actually true. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a scientist to ask those questions, and every member of the public can understand those questions. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, I'm so, you want, I'm not a person to talk about which scientist or which scientific theory is, is, is right or wrong. I totally admit, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not equipped to make that decision. So, when we're talking about shortcomings, well, we have been told repeatedly that these are the world's top scientists, the mm. best and the brightest, have been selected to write this report. No, 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 no. Now, we must understand that because the IPCC is 25 years old mm. and it is now completing its fifth major report mm. and there have been numerous smaller, shorter reports, mm. there have probably been about 9,000 scientists over the years mm -hmm. that have been involved as authors to some degree mm -hmm. with the IPCC. Now some of those scientists have in fact been brilliant and they have been world-class experts at the top of their field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not going to say that every scientist has, has been a disappointment. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that there are lots of people who are helping to write the IPCC reports who are not world-class scientists. So one category is graduate students. Now there's nothing wrong with graduate students helping a, a you know, world-renowned authority mm -hmm. um, do their research and helping them write up that research. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the IPCC is making graduate students lead authors. Lead authors! or even worse, coordinating lead authors, which means they're ahead in charge of a chapter. Mm. Okay, so we have a number of cases of this. We have a gentleman named Richard Klein, mm. who became a lead author for the IPCC at the tender age of 25. Mm. He was years and years and years from finishing his doctorate, mm. but he was a lead author already. We have another gentleman who became a lead author for the IPCC. They're relying on his expertise, his expert judgment, mm -hmm. before he'd even finished his master's degree. Yes, so, you know, we're told that these are the best and brightest the world has to offer. No, I'm sorry. You know, I, I found, and this was very unsystematic, this mm -hmm. was just me, you know, you know, checking things out and stumbling across, you know, a few cases which then ended up being you know, a number of cases, and I've written a chapter about this in my book, mm. where, you know, um, one of the women who was, who was selected back in 1994, I think, mm. to write the very first health chapter mm. for the IPCC, in which they talked about malaria mm. as being, a, you know, an issue with climate change, and they talked about it in a very amateurish, inaccurate way, right. but people still, many years later, are still pointing to that and saying, the IPCC says malaria is going to get worse because of climate change. Mm. Well, this woman had not even 
she was, first of all, she was years from getting her PhD. It would be 16 years later before she completed her PhD. Mm -hmm. It would be three years before she published her first academic paper. She was not, she was not an expert in anything. I'm but sorry, she was a lead author? I think at that point she was a contributing author. But contributing. having not actually that's right. written a single that's piece right. of academic literature that's up right. until that point it in time. It would be three years before her first academic paper was published, and yet she was on the team. Her name is on that part of the IPCC report. So we have very young and inexperienced people. And again, I'm sure there are some very brilliant young people. You know, um, but, you know, they're... They're surely a rare, rare occurrence in science for someone who has not even completed doc their doctorate to to be, you know, considered a world class expert. Mm -hmm. And if those people are those exceptions, the IPCC really has to make the case. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't. The, you know, it has a history since at least the mid 1990s of ha of appointing very young, inexperienced people to be authors of its reports. So, right, so unqualified scientists, obviously that's a fairly serious issue, particularly when you're dealing with a peak body such as the IPCC. But even if they're not qualified yet, if their methods are okay, then their work is probably gonna be okay. So are you, sim are you nitpicking at this point? Are you simply just trying to pick the eyes out of, out of what they've done when, when the actual results stack up? Well, you know, um, it's not nitpicking. If an organization goes around telling you again and again and again, we mm. are the world's top scientists, we are the creme de la creme, mm. we are the best, and then you find out that you have these 20-something graduate students, you have been misled. Mm. And it's not just the graduate students. You know, another whole category of very questionable authors are people who have links to activist organizations, green organizations. Now, the IPCC is sort of like a trial, right? The, the, the people who work for the IPCC are, are, are holding a trial and CO2 is, 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 is the accused. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they have to decide whether human-generated CO2 is guilty of causing you know, possible climate catastrophe. Mm. So when you have a trial, everyone is supposed to try very hard to be neutral and objective mm. and dispassionate and even-handed mm. and to look like you're be they're being neutral, not just being neutral. Mm. And what ha what's happening with the IPCC is we have all kinds of green activists who are being chosen to be lead authors mm. and to lead chapters. They have an agenda. Okay? A green organization get, raises money by scaring people. Mm -hmm. you know, so anyone who, who has worked for 20 years for Greenpeace is not an objective scientist. They cannot be part of the jury who, that decides whether CO2 is guilty because their organization has already made up its mind. So you're saying that there are lead authors there who are have contributed there are. to the uh, the the um, what, what do you call them the assessment reports? Yes, yes. Um, who have been card carrying members of, of employees of green groups. So, for example, William Hare, Bill Hare, is mm -hmm. a very well known Greenpeace activist. Mm -hmm. You can find remarks on on Greenpeace websites that say he's a legend in in the Greenpeace organization. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill Hare has been involved with with the IPCC for a long time. And last time they put out their assessment report in 2007, mm. he was one of only 40 people who was part of the core writing team mm. for the summary of summaries. Okay, so it's not just out on the margins you mm. find a Greenpeace person here and there. Mm. This man is part of the core writing team. Mm. Okay, you look into the heart of the IPCC and you find a Greenpeace employee, mm -hmm. a legend in Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of other Greenpeace people, affiliations that are a problem. One of the other people involved with the IPCC for a long time is Richard Moss. He's an American. Now for a while, he was while he was working with the IPCC, he was also 
a vice president of the World Wildlife Fund. Mm -hmm. Now those are the people that bring us Earth Hour, mm -hmm. you know, their main concern these days is climate change. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that he's supposed to be this neutral guy on the jury deciding whether CO2 is guilty or not, mm -hmm. he's taking a paycheck from the World Wildlife Fund. Another person with the World Wildlife Fund with, with those kinds of connections is, is a woman named Jennifer Morgan. Mm -hmm. Now, she has spent her entire career working for activist organizations. I'm sure she's a very pleasant person, but she is by no stretch of the imagination one of the world's top scientists. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of her previous jobs was as the chief spokesperson on climate change for the World Wildlife mm -hmm. Fund. And now she is helping prepare the, the report that is about to come out this September. Mm. So how could this be? Mm. How could this be? And in fact, when I started looking carefully at World Wildlife Fund links, mm. around 2004, which was when the last report was just getting underway, mm. the World Wildlife Fund did something very curious. They deliberately went out and recruited climate scientists. And then they bragged that they had recruited 130 scientists, mm -hmm. mostly but not exclusively from the IPCC, to sit on a World Wildlife Fund panel. Mm -hmm. So at the very time when these scientists are supposed to be this dispassionate, neutral jury deciding some very important questions that the whole world is, is waiting for the answer, mm -hmm. They're partying with the WWF. They're hanging out with the WWF. So when I started noticing that and looking at the names, my calculations by the end of it was that two-thirds of the chapters in the last IPCC report, mm -hmm. out of 44 chapters, mm -hmm. two-thirds of those chapters had at least one person and up to eight people with links to the WWF. Wow. And one-third of the chapters was actually led by a person with WWF connections. Usually a chapter has two leaders, mm -hmm. and so a third of the chapters had at least one person, and in one case there were both of the leaders had mm -hmm. WWF connections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're conducting a trial, you have to look like you're neutral, mm -hmm. and the IPCC is not a grown-up. It's not a professional organization. It's not playing, um, you know, at a world-class level. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, come on, come mm -hmm. on. You, you want me to take your, your, your opinion seriously and you've got all of these people with these very strong activist connections? Mm -hmm. How can I trust your judgment? This is basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, in, a lot of people would argue, though, that the science is settled, that it's not really a, a, a problem that there are activists uh, within the IPCC because there are activists agitating in favour of, of a question that's already been answered. Uh, if we already know that CO2 is the culprit, uh, if the science really is settled, um, then surely we're going to have people who believe that, the, that CO2 is the culprit working for, for organisations because that's settled. Well, except you have to pay attention to the actual actual things that the IPCC says. So the IPCC wrote four ma major reports, and when the last one came out in 2007, what they said was that it is our opinion that the, there has been unequivocal warming over the last couple hundred years. Well, we all know that because 1815 was the end of the Little Ice Age. So big surprise people that it has been gradually warming since 1850. Mm. So the warming is unequivocal and in our opinion, most of the warming in the last 50 years is very likely mm. to have been caused by humans. Our opinion most of the warming, they can't tell you how much, mm. and then they can't tell you with certainty. They're just, our opinion is that it's very likely. Mm. That doesn't sound like settled science mm. to me. That sounds like the experts are giving us their opinion. Mm. And experts have a long history of being wrong. Mm. So, you know, um, when what what the people who write the IPCC report are doing is is exactly that they are giving us their opinion 
of what the data tells us. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important that the people who are providing that opinion be neutral and look like they're neutral. Mm -hmm. In order to keep and, and maintain public trust. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, okay, that's, that's a lot on the actual, the authors and, and their credentials and, and so on and so forth. Uh, your book ranges a lot more widely than that. So let's just dip into some of the other things that, you, that you've that you discovered along the way and some of the other topics that you cover. Take it away. Well, one of the things is that the chairman of the IPCC has been going around the world for many years saying we rely solely on peer-reviewed literature, that everything we look at when we write our, our report has the, that, that stamp of peer-reviewed literature. It has gone through this process to be, it has been published in a reputable scientific journal, mm -hmm. and if it's not um, been published, then we don't have anything to do with it. In fact, it's it's it belongs in the in the dustbin. Right. He's actually said things like that mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Well, that turns out to be total nonsense. And you know, the first time I read I read this this economist Richard Tall mm -hmm. wrote a blog post. And he said, you know, I'm very annoyed because in this part of the IPCC report, they ignored the peer-reviewed literature and what that, those conclusions were, and they cited non-peer-reviewed literature, mm -hmm. gray literature it's sometimes called, to make the opposite point. And I thought, wait a minute, it's all supposed to be peer-reviewed literature, how could that be? So for the very first time, mm -hmm. I went and I looked at that particular chapter of the IPCC report. They're all online, it's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. Went to the end of it, and there are pages and pages of references that were cited within that chapter. Mm -hmm. And I started saying, okay, so is this a peer-reviewed piece of literature? Yes, is that one? No. Mm -hmm. Is that one? No. And for the very first time, I did something. This report was three years old, and no one else, no other journalist had ever done this before, actually go and look at that list. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was that a startling number were not from the peer-reviewed literature. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe it's just this chapter. So then I went and looked at another chapter, and that one was even worse. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of, so I think, you know, one was 50% and one was 26% were peer-reviewed citations, but the rest of the, thing, of the sources in that list were not. So a majority of the sources... In some cases. In, in, in some of the chapters that you looked at, and we're talking about the AR4 report, the 2007 That's right. IPCC report, which is still online. Anyone could go and double-check right. yes. what, yes. what you've looked at. A majority of the sources in some of the chapters were not peer-reviewed. That's right. That's right. That, that really jars me because I'm one of the people who's heard over and over again that it is all the settled science, it's all the peer-reviewed literature, it's all the best literature that's out there. So, yes, so, and that's what I heard and that's what I believed and I read it again and again. So I said to myself, well, you know, we have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. There's 44 chapters, there's lots of references, I can't do this myself. Mm -hmm. So in 2010, I asked for volunteers to help me, I, I asked on my blog, mm -hmm. and these amazing people from all over the world stepped forward and helped me examine all 44 chapters. It was something like <coughs> 18,000 um, references altogether, I think 18,500, some of them were in there. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was three people working independently, they didn't know each other, they didn't know they had the same chapter, mm -hmm. went and did those calculations, what's peer-reviewed journal, what's not, mm -hmm. and they, they sent in their results to me. When there was a small discrepancy, we took the one that was most favorable to the IPCC, mm -hmm. we, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. we're not going to be nitpicking here. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the process, which was five weeks of very intense, mm -hmm. intense counting and lots of emails from all over the world <laughs> and lots of time zones coming in and going out again, the, the conclusion was that a full 30% of the sources being cited by the IPCC mm -hmm. in its 2007 report were not peer-reviewed literature. They hadn't come within a mile of being peer-reviewed mm -hmm. literature. Some of them were press releases. Now anyone can say anything in a press release, as you very well know. Some of them were Greenpeace. Um, you know, documents. Mm. Some of them were student theses. Mm. Um, you know, other ones were working papers that had simply been, you know, delivered at a conference and there had been no, 
no um, checking of any sort had gone on. So one third of all of the total references. And as you worked your way through the report, by the time you got to working group three, there's working group one, two, and three in the IPCC report, often the vast majority of the references were not peer-reviewed literature. So what does this tell you about this organization? The chairman is going around repeatedly saying to everyone who will listen, including testifying before, before committees of, 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 of politicians, mm -hmm. we only look at peer-reviewed literature. Mm -hmm. Well, lots and lots of people knew that he was telling a fib. Mm -hmm. And no one pulled him aside and said, sir, we can't say that. Mm. That's, that's, that's not, not true. true. Yeah. And, no, and you know, you've heard all about these, um, these letters, the open letters that all kinds of scientists get together and they write an open letter and say, we have to do this something right now or the world's going to end. Mm -hmm. You know, all those open letters. Why didn't a bunch of people who were participants in the IPCC report get together and write an open letter mm -hmm. to a newspaper or to a, a, an academic journal and say, hey, we support the IPCC, we think what it's doing is important, but the public is being misled. Mm -hmm. A third of the references are not, you know, or a large number of them. We're the only ones who, you know, actually did who the actually did the that. math. That's and right. The one that brought it to your attention in the first place was a case where the person who actually brought it up was saying that the literature they chose, the non-peer-reviewed literature they chose, was saying the opposite That's right. of the peer-reviewed literature that they could have, That's have right. chosen. And in my book, I discuss a number of situations like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it doesn't look like it's accidental. It looks mm -hmm. like people are, have go in to the IPCC writing process with a narrative in mind, and they choose their literature that is going to support that narrative. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. They're mm -hmm. supposed to be surveying the literature in an honest way way, in a dispassionate way, and mm. writing in a report about what that literature says. Mm. But, you know, that's not what happens. So, so we have an IPCC that is very renowned and is very respected, and people say, oh, but look, there's all these procedures. Mm. Well, you can write down all the rules you want, mm. but rules are no good if you're not enforcing them. Yeah. So, you know, you can have your, your speed limits, but unless there are some police, you know, giving people speeding tickets, mm -hmm. do, is anyone people don't don't follow the speed limit even though they know there are police around well you know in my book I say the IPCC is is a bit like that mm -hmm. they put it, all these rules on paper they sound very impressive mm -hmm. but there's no enforcement mechanism mm -hmm. there is no one in the IPC structure who goes around and says you didn't follow that rule yeah. and so you know you have to rewrite that mm -hmm. and you know what what happened when the last report came out in 2007 is is there were all kinds of problems, there were all kinds of rules that had been broken, and, you know, d did anyone um, call them on it? Did the press say, yes, but you didn't follow that rule, and you didn't follow that rule? No, they got a Nobel Pro Peace Prize, yeah. right? Shortly after the report came out in 2007, the IPCC shares the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore, and there could not be any, any better demonstration of how you can break all sorts of rules at the IPCC and my book talks about many of them mm. and there are absolutely no consequences in fact you get a, you get a Nobel Prize out of it right so so we have been told all of these things there are there are rules there you know this is how we this is the literature we look at and only this literature mm. this is the people who are writing those reports it turns out none of it is actually it's it's it really is a house of cards so if we can't trust the IPCC, who can we trust? Is there a body out there that is actually doing genuinely transparent, peer-reviewed work on this issue that we could turn to as a replacement, I guess, to, for the IPCC? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I think, you know, what I say at the end of my book is, you know, the when you have a murder case mm. and you find out that someone on the jury um, actually had a, a an interest or a conflict, mm -hmm. then you have to say, 
we throw out the conviction. We have to start at the beginning again. Mm -hmm. We have to do the trial over again, mm -hmm. and we have to get people, we have to select our people more carefully this time mm -hmm. so that they, they don't come with any preconceived notions. We need a new trial. We need an organization, presumably, that um, you know that that you know has conflict of interest rules that it, that it, it that are followed that you know is is going to follow its its procedures is going to have enforcement mechanisms in place. I don't know. I don't know where we get that organization. And you know, frankly, this is a UN body. Mm -hmm. It was established by you know, the UN is a political body. They set up the IPCC. And it's not science academies who sit around and say, who are the best people in this field? Let's get them to write the report. No, it's governments. Mm -hmm. And so governments change. You know, when, when Bill Clinton and Al Gore were, were running the US, the, the scientists who got nominated to work on the IPCC were probably different than when George Bush was one in the U.S., right? So when governments are choosing scientists, mm -hmm. there is there is you know room for political influence. For political, that's right. So you know, the, I don't think that a um, you know that that politics and science mm -hmm. mix mm -hmm. very well. And um, you know, we're told that the IPCC is out there to tell us what's going on with climate change, but in fact, there's actually another reason, the real reason the IPCC exists, and that is because the UN decided back in 1992, now 1992, the IPCC had been around for a mere four years, okay? Climate science was a very immature science in 1992, but the UN had already decided that human-generated CO2 was a problem. Mm -hmm. And at the Earth Summit in 1992, 100, I think, 60 countries signed on to a treaty that says we have to control mm -hmm. CO2 emissions. The politics came before the science. Yeah. And so the purpose of the IPCC is to write a document that says where the science is. So when the countries are negotiating, to, to advance the, the aims of that treaty, mm. they're all on the same page. Mm. Right? That's really what the IPCC report is for. It is a basis for politicians to negotiate a political treaty. Mm. It's not about science. And the scientists are not in charge. And we're going to see that in a few months because the science section, Working Group 1, is going to finish their report and the scientists are going to write a summary. The report is probably going to be about a thousand pages, mm -hmm. and the summary for policymakers, they call it, is going to be a couple dozen pages. Right. And that's a very difficult thing, taking mm -hmm. 14 chapters mm -hmm. and, and boiling them down to a few dozen pages. Yeah. Well, if this was a science body, that's where it would stop. The scientists would write the summary and they would give it to, to the head of the IPCC, and that would be the end of the matter. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's going to happen. The IPCC in late September is going to have a four-day meeting in which this document, this summary, which was written by scientists, mm. is going to have every single sentence argued over by diplomats and politicians and bureaucrats. The summary of what the science says is going to get rewritten in a political negotiating session that's going to last four days. That's just bizarre. So the scientists don't have the last word on what their report says. Yeah. The politicians will decide by horse trading. And some of these meetings in the past have gone 24-7 in the last few days because they have to rush to finish it all. Mm. So, so politicians are going to decide what the science report says. So let's see if I can try and put the pieces together here and summarize. We have a body that is perceived to be the peak scientific body using non-peer reviewed literature written in some cases by undergraduates and, and people who do not yet have the kinds of credentials that the IPCC would have us believe some of whom have vested interests and preconceived notions about what should or shouldn't be said or what their opinion should or shouldn't be, which is then second-guessed by policymakers, politicians and bureaucrats who have probably not much of a better understanding of the science than you and I. Hmm. 
And that then becomes the that, most authoritative document, the Bible, if you, if, if you will. That summary is mm. going to be what the world's politicians and the world's journalists read. That's, That's incredible. Right. That's right. So Donna, if we can't, if we can't rely on the IPCC to, to have provided us with just absolute bulletproof, reliable information, and, and what you're telling me is that the information does not live up to the standards that the IPCC itself sets for itself. What does that say of policy responses, carbon taxes, trading schemes, the, the kinds of things that we've seen introduced in Australia and in Europe, the kinds of things that well, Barack Obama has just recently in a speech put our climate change back on the agenda for the, for the US. What are we doing introducing policies to fight climate change if the IPCC's data is, is not necessarily reliable to begin with? How do we manage this side of the, of the issue? Well, and that is the issue. You know, there are lots of taxes, there are lots of regulations being put in place to deal with a problem that, frankly, we don't know if it's really a problem or not, because the organizations that are telling us that it is, they're not reliable, they're not trustworthy, they have not been behaving in, in a trustworthy manner. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we have a problem now, and it is, in my view, insane to spend lots of time and money putting policies in place to respond to a problem that we're not even sure exists, mm -hmm. and we're not even sure is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a journalist, when I look at climate policy, mm -hmm. I find an astonishing absence of rigor. What I find is expensive decisions and important decisions being made and no one has done the math. It's mm. crazy. It's, but that's, that's climate policy at the moment. Mm, that is incredible. And um, so to get from where we are now to a situation where we can actually bring some sense into the debate, uh, obviously we talked a moment ago about the need to almost start again, retrial, re you know, throw out the old jury and, and, and have a retrial. In the mind of the public, what, what could someone who's, who's watching this do to help prepare and educate themselves? If, if they were willing to be that neutral observer, how would they begin to find, I mean, you, you were saying you managed to find people who had a different point of view and that's how you started. You simply wanted that alternative point of view to be heard and to be seen. Where, where can people go to, to hear these voices? Well, I think, you know, just healthy skepticism is a, is a good place to start. Mm. And, you know, there there is actually now a very vibrant um, discussion happening mm. online. Mm. You know, whether you're, you're, you, you want to access it by Twitter or Facebook yeah. or, or the blogosphere, mm. there are actually some, some you know, you just, um, you know, Google climate change and the climate debate, mm. and there are different voices out there. And I think it's very important that people actually um, expose themselves to a variety of opinions. Mm. And, you know, I don't know who's right. Um, I am I started out just saying the public has a right to know that mm. there is a debate going on. Mm. And I now call myself a climate skeptic because after nearly four years of research, I have not seen anything that convinces me that there is a catastrophe in the making. Mm. What I've seen is a lot of assumptions piled on assumptions, piled on assumptions, and at each level, there are, there are serious reasons to question whether that assumption is valid or not. Mm. So, so, you know, I think we need more discussion, we need more debate, mm. and I am very cross whenever I hear politicians like, like um, um, Ed Davey, who's the uh, energy minister in the UK this mm. week, say, um, you know, um, there shouldn't be a debate, the debate is over, anyone who's a skeptic is a crackpot. Mm. Pardon me, when did it become the job of an elected official to insult the viewpoint of large numbers of of the public. Mm. You know, that is just not appropriate behavior. Mm. Donna, I want to go right back to a comment you made a while ago about, about experts and how often they've been wrong. I want to pick that up because that's, that I think is quite a, an astonishing thing in, in a post-enlightenment era where science is so respected and scientists are supposed to be so reliable and, and applying a scientific method that keeps them honest removes their own biases and makes sure that, that what they're telling us really is the best of our knowledge at this point in time. We can all allow for knowledge to improve and knowledge to change, but at any given point in time, the experts are supposed to be telling us 
the best that we know. Um, yet that seems to not be the case here with, with the IPCC. Is this an unprecedented problem? Are we, are, we, are we facing a downfall of science in a sense? I think certainly science's reputation is, is suffering. Mm. I used to have great respect for science and scientists until I started doing this research. Mm. My opinion of scientists and scientific bodies has plummeted as a result. And that's, that's a sad thing. That is a sad thing. Um, I think we need to remember that the experts are usually wrong. Historically, the experts have been wrong about all sorts of things. And, you know, just in one person's lifetime, you know, when I was a child, the big scare when I was in primary school was acid rain. And we got sat down and shown these scary films about how by the time we were grown ups, there were going to be no forests left because they were going to be wiped out by, you know, all these terrible chemicals that, that industry was putting in, in, in into the atmosphere. Well, you know, there was a bit of concern, there was a bit of a kernel of truth to that, mm. but the big, big scare was way overblown and was exaggerated, but that was the experts of the day telling us. Mm. And then there was the ozone layer, mm. right? And then there was, a, 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 prior to that, there was global cooling, and prior mm. to that, there was the population bomb. Mm. You know, millions of people were going to starve to death because we couldn't possibly feed this many humans. Mm. There's always something. Mm. And that is interesting. We should know our history and we should also understand that psychologically there's obviously something in us as human beings where we are perhaps, we have been primed by evolution to always be worried about our survival and mm -hmm. our existence. So we are very predisposed mm -hmm. to a narrative that says, you know, we're all going to die, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And we're also predisposed to a narrative that says, you know, um, the, 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 the Eden myth, you know, that we have sinned and now we have to, you know, we, we're going to be punished, mm -hmm. right? So it's not God punishing us, it's Mother Nature punishing us. Mm -hmm. those, those ideas are very powerful in our psyche. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that there are all kinds of temperaments, of, there are all kinds of personalities out there. You know, I think of myself as a calm, cool, and collected person, mm -hmm. per, you know, personality type. There are also drama queens, mm. right? And everything is always a crisis. It's not a problem. Um, you know, the, the you know the you know the world's going to end, right? Mm -hmm. This is the drama queens have deserve a voice, but we should not be letting our our public policy be dominated by that voice. You know, they should be part of the debate, but not you know. Um, leading us and and I think we you know okay that person is a drama queen mm -hmm. you know that doesn't mean they're bad it just means the way their their personality makeup they're going to take every small issue mm -hmm. and 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 think it's the end of the world mm -hmm. you know rather than my my personal approach is you know we're, we're smart we're ingenious we are creative and we will solve the problems that come our way and so will our children and grandchildren mm -hmm. Well, Donna, it's been an absolute pleasure. And just before we finish, I just want to throw it open to you. And if there's anything else that we haven't covered yet or that you really think uh, people ought to know about, now's the time. Just think for yourself and, um, you know, trust yourself. And there are lots of experts. As a journalist, I can tell you that I can find an expert who will say anything if I call mm -hmm. enough people and do enough research. So really, the, you know, the experts often don't know any more than you and I about what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And there has been no case that I'm aware of where anyone has ever been successful at predicting the future. Mm -hmm. So the idea that climate scientists have this crystal ball and they know what's coming, mm -hmm. I find that very hard to believe and, and I would hope that, that the average person, you know, who's very sensible and who's dealing with real problems in the real world, um, would, would um, you know, think about that. Skepticism. Exactly. A healthy dose of skepticism. Absolutely. Well, Donna, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.